Transportation Matters, the CEO podcast of Daimler Trucks and Buses. Welcome to Transportation Matters. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Martin Daum. I'm the CEO of Daimler Truck. With this new episode, we are starting the fifth season of our podcast. And our goal today is to give you an inside view of our company. At Daimler Truck, we aim high. We aim to lead sustainable transportation. And we can only do so because we have a great team. We have great experienced people and we have great young talents. I'm glad to have two young talents with me today. Katharina Zeiser and Philipp Litzinger. I'm curious how they came to our company and what their experience has been so far. And of course, we will discuss what it's like to work for a leading truck and bus manufacturer in the midst of the historic transformation of our industry. So Katharina and Philip, great that you are with us today. Before you introduce you officially, potentially a first question, why are you here at Daimler Truck? By accident, by purpose, as a lifelong target, which started in kindergarten, or it just happened? Well, if you ask me, when I was in school, I would always say, well, Mercedes, that's not the place I want to be. But over my studies, I noticed that for me, it's important to work for a company where I see a product that I believe in, that I see some sense behind. And I think with Daimler Trucks, that's definitely the case. It's a product that I can relate to, and that's very important for me. In addition to that, I would say one other important point is that I see the opportunity to learn and grow in an organization. And that's definitely what I've seen in Daimler Trucks so far. So I'm really happy to be with Daimler Trucks and Buses. And Philip, what's your way? As I studied automotive technology, for me, it was clear I want to live this fascination uh, in my job. And at Daimler Truck, I can combine my fascination for vehicles and also a purpose. For me, it is really important to have an impact in my job. And in a big company like Daimler Truck, with the influence on transportation, this is the best place. So what are you doing today at Daimler? As I mentioned, I, I started as a working student. My field was the system integration hill, so the hardware in the loop, testing of electronic control units. At that time, I was working a lot with DTICI together. It was directly international and very, very interesting. May I interrupt you here? Sure. Because this goes to an audience that for them, hardware in the loop sound potentially like a cookie or some sweets to, to eat. And DTICI is an acronym that I would say outside this room is not so much. Yeah, I will give an explanation. What's Hardware in the Loop? Hardware in the Loop is kind of a testing rig for a new ECU, an electronic control unit, so like a small computer in our vehicles. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you have a test rig where you can simulate the environment. So for example, we have one small computer and the rest of the vehicle is simulated. So you don't have to build up a truck. Exactly. So you play with your computer, but it, the computer yeah. thinks he's running a big body ton truck. Exactly. And DTICI is our company in India, right. where we have a lot of engineers and working together with those guys in India as part of your job. And after this uh, working position, I uh, stayed in that field. So I tried to combine this hill sector with test management. So that was my topic in the master thesis. And in this case, I, I, I had a lot of online meetings with people from India, from Portland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. I tried to combine and to, to find synergies of all our expertise around the world. And Katharina? I joined Daimler after studying. So I did a dual study program and my master while working, so to say, with a different company. And then I joined with the trainee program and mm. I did most of my assignments in the connectivity environment. So transforming our business, so to say, from just building trucks and selling them, but mm -hmm. offering services beyond that. Mm -hmm. And since end of last year, I'm now team lead in the engineering IT. Again, a couple <laughs> of uh, acronyms. I, I remember I was once doing... Yeah, sometimes you get even as a board member bored. I started to write down 
all the acronyms. And I think I had more than 40 within half an hour. And it's like an own language. So team lead means in engineering IT, if you could explain sure. those two. <laughs> so I'm leading a team of seven people. And in the engineering IT, I guess IT is a known word, but information technology. But engineering IT means that the department is, so to say, responsible for all the systems that we need to develop a truck mm -hmm. and where we need to save our parts mm -hmm. list and everything that goes into the truck, so to say. And team lead means you have people working for you? So, yes, exactly. So, and and what, what's that for an experience? It's a very interesting, but also joyful experience, developing people, working together with them and allowing them to reach their full potential. I think the leadership talent program is actually developed to get exactly there. And I'm really happy that I got there and I now have the opportunity to work together with this team and allow them to reach their full potential to do the best for our company as well. Really great. And you both started with us with the trainee program. Sometimes I hear criticisms as trainees, those are those arrogant persons who think they become board members by itself and don't have to work. And I, hardworking person, have to go now through endless years of service until someone recognizes me. How would you describe a trainee program? I've heard exactly that experience as well from all different kind of sides. But I also see that the perspective is changing and that people really appreciate if trainees actually put in the hard work as well. And it's not only about being pushed, but you also still need to deliver in order to reach what is out there for you. It's not only because people allow you to get there, but you still need to bring in your own workforce as mm -hmm. well. Actually, I joined Daimler in 87. And I joined, then it was called International Nachwuchsgruppe. I think today we would say trainee program. And what I always liked, that it gave me, at the start, an intro into that huge group of 100,000 people, which if you would start only in a department, it limits your potential. The fun part of my career was that in the same office, there was started another guy, his name was Hubertus Troska, and he was not in the International Nachwuchsgruppe. So that was the only difference in our resume so far. And we both ended up as board members. So to everyone listening, it doesn't matter whether you start in a trainee program or not, you have the same career chances as Hubertus Troska and I were the living proof of. However, I still really loved it because of the international part of the broad experience you get. Did you have, uh, Philip, by the way, any international assignments so far, other than working with the guys in India? So far, uh, unfortunately not. But um, since I started in October last year, there will be time. Yeah. 10 months with the company, it has time to get abroad. Exactly. But, but you I'm, would love to go abroad. Yes. I'm currently planning it. So I would like to go to Brazil mm -hmm. because my, my home department is the vehicle testing in mm -hmm. Mannheim at Daimler mm -hmm. Buses. Okay. So in Brazil, there will be a pendant mm -hmm. and that would be great to have some yeah. experience there. But I understand, Katarina, you had been already abroad. Yes, exactly. I had a chance to go to Japan for six months. I stayed with the connectivity area, but it was a really different experience from the setup. Mm -hmm. The team there is rather small. The challenges are different, but the market just requires to adapt to it and not just take everything mm -hmm. that we think is normal mm -hmm. here in Stuttgart, mm -hmm. but we need to really see what is required on a local basis as well. Oh, by the way, Katarina, before I forget to ask, Just to, to ask you, how long are you with Daimler? We know Philip is 10 months here. I'm, by the way, I'm 36 years with Daimler. You are somewhere in between. I exactly. Understand. I'm somewhere in between. I joined in 2019, so it's now four Ooh. years. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So you're really a uh, long time already with Daimler. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but another 32 years to go, certainly. So, but I understand what I got from you, whether 10 months or 36 years or you in between. We love to work for this company. Yeah, so the blog which comes now is not meant as an advertising blog, so, but it's more like to rationalize what is it what makes us excited in the complete different environments we work, in the complete different length we have with this company, but what do we really love about that company, more in a general term. And one thing is, these days, when we in my age group talk about 
your age group, yeah, then we say, oh, is these are these post-materialistic, purpose-seeking generation. And if we are cynic, we sometimes say parental financed generation. Uh, yeah, so money is not that important. Is it truly the case that money is not that important? Or how does money and purpose play with each other? And I can give my spiel of a guy who is now 60 plus and tell what was with you. But let's start with you guys. Purpose or money or both or nothing? <laughs> nothing, no. <laughs> But it's definitely uh, the purpose. So when I looking back, I, I started at Mercedes-Benz passenger cars. And while I was studying, I went to Bosch, I went to ITK Engineering. So I had several stations and was working on kind of sports cars. But for me, the reliability and robustness of our vehicles, this is something if you are an engineer, that's cool stuff. And in such a big company, we have this broad technology. So we have electric driven, we have hydrogen. So if you are an engineer and you are fascinated by technology and you want to have an impact, looking on that mm. things, so climate change is a topic for us. Mm. This is the best combination. Katarina, for you? I would agree with that. I think money is not completely non-important, but it just adds to the offer. In the end, the product, as I mentioned in the beginning, is one of the major parts for me. I need a product that I can relate to, that is interesting to me, that I want to contribute to, Because in the end, all of our work contributes to the end product that we sell to our customers. And I would say and nothing has changed so much since my days when, when I did my decision coming to a company. I would always say money is important because something has to feed the family. And uh, we know our talents and we wouldn't give them for free. But on the other side, we always want a company where we can be proud of working for, where it makes sense to work. and the work itself. And for me, it was always another aspect what I would call a truly global team. I really love that people work over borders, where nationality, upbringing, culture does not play a role. We work for a common cause. That was always was what intrigued me from the very first day. And that's something which I think fascinating. I fully agree to that, whether it's within Daimler trucks and buses or outside in my mm. previous experience, I always enjoyed working in global teams, mm. whether that is all on site and you just work remotely with other departments and they impact the work that you do. Or I also had the experience outside of Daimler where I was the only one sitting in Germany and we mm. were distributed mm. across the mm. whole world. But I think in whatever scenario you're working together on a global basis, the main part is that you get different perspectives and that brings us so much further than if we just stick with people that have all the same mindset, the same background and the same ideas. Now you told us that you had been in Japan for some time. What was the biggest learning you had for you as a person which you can use now in your today's work as well? In Japan, I feel like you need to spend a lot more time on building relationships, whereas here it's rather easy to just interact with somebody and then you have some kind of connection already. And it takes much longer to build these close connections in Japan. But once you have built them, they're super strong and you can always rely on them. So I think that's something that one needs just needs to be aware of. And that also shapes the collaboration beyond the time being in Japan that you know somebody that you can ask and they will help you. And I think that's just something that can never be underestimated and that you don't understand if you have not been there and really had that experience in person. That's really cool because when you were talking, I thought of, of a similar experience I had in the US. A friend of mine once told me, in Germany, you need to have successful project or business experience with each other and then you might become friends in the US, you first have to become friends to have a successful business experience. For me, that was clear. And I still remember I have a good friend in the US and he still remembers his first encounter with me. We didn't know each other at all. And he said, and Martin Arm was storming to the room, asked me a core question of my business and then was four hours of intense discussion. And then he started to ask, by the way, What was your name? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and he said that was so 
un-American. But on the other side, I would say this, I, I, I love in this international and to learn. And I would say the personal relationship is, is definitely important. Any experience you had, Philip, in India? When I was studying in my bachelor's degree, I went for one semester abroad. So mm -hmm. I studied in Malaysia. Okay. And I could collect some, some experience. So with this culture... In Malaysia, you also have uh, mixed cultures, so there are a lot of Indian people, Indonesian, Chinese, mm. or from Singapore. And from that, I took a lot with me, and, and it's kind of this Asian culture, I guess, where the people are more, not to say shy, uh, but um, you have to be maybe a bit more friendly or more... You take more time just to, to have a relationship. You can say negative. Our culture is more bullish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. If I have the elbows and, uh, and, and the guts, uh, then I interrupt you and talk like yeah. what I'm doing now at the moment, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which would be so un-Malaysian. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And that is to learn weaker signals, you know, to, to have exactly. more empathy yeah. towards the other one. Yeah. Also, I can add to this feeling in our trainee group, I guess, with this kind of internationally impact so when we are have meetings from the talent track and the expert track everybody's just on the same wave and you can feel that that everybody's really enjoying uh, to be here so we have the purpose we have the truly global team another aspect for me is always a corporate culture what comes to your mind and i would say what's the number one thing what makes a culture to work inside i'm not talk special i have to take this comparison because I played for 25 years football and so I'm, I'm a team player and that mm -hmm. was what I found here. I'm now in the second rotation so I can both teams, everyone helps each other, be respectful. But on the other hand also take the chance to give feedback. So mm -hmm. this, these are the three points I would say. And how would you rate the coaches of your teams here? <laughs> <laughs> because in soccer, I, I understand there are completely different types of coaches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good. I'm, I'm very glad so far um, because I was not sure when I came from the university how, how will it be to have a boss or a team leader. But you get a lot of trust since you're just for a few months here. But the good thing on it, you have an impact from the first day. And Katarina, you already have the chance to be someone who can create culture in your small team. But on the other side, I could see that sometimes as a challenge too, you want to create something in your team, which potentially the company does not allow. Do you sense those conflicts or are the company culture and that what you would like to do with your team fits with each other? And please speak up if there is something you would change in the company. For me, actually, it fits quite well. I feel like I have the freedom and the opportunity to lead my team in a way that they also want to be led. It's not only about how I want to lead, but I feel it's a lot about people and what they need in order to be happy in the company, to do their best. Mm -hmm. And I think there we really have the opportunities and it's going down on individual level. What does every single one of them need, but also what do they need as mm -hmm. a group? Very good. What do you see with the people working with you? What, what makes them as motivated as possible and what would frustrate people working for you? What motivates them is I think if they're heard and seen, mm -hmm. if they get the, get the opportunity to do what they want to do in, in a sense as well. Not in the sense that they just want to sit around and do nothing, but more in the sense that Well, they're here for a purpose as well. They want to do good work and allowing them to do exactly that is one of the most motivating things that mm. we as team leaders and leaders in general in a company can do. And I think the exact opposite is what frustrates them. If we have lengthy processes, no progress in different topics, I think that's where a lot of frustration comes from. What I once learned from a good friend was When I was a little bit skeptical about, you know, our diverse culture, age, countries, functions in the company, and his response was, Martin, what frustrates people, what motivates people is universal. And I would say that's exactly what you say, to be seen, to be heard, you know, to, to have a feeling and influence and being not just a, a small wheel in a, in a huge machine that has to move, otherwise it's replaced by another similar wheel. To be significant, I think that is important. Definitely. Uh, definitely. <laughs> I have to admit it, that was exactly the feeling what I thought when I started here. Maybe I'm just a very, very 
small piece in a very big, big machine. machine. Yeah. But it's not like that. And that's the great thing. So I was not confident enough to think, okay, I'm starting now directly from the university. But you're doing this program, you learn every day, and someday you are an expert mm -hmm. and you can really uh, contribute. And I would say this is certainly in a large company the biggest challenge. You can say in a small, if, if we would be a, a 20 people company, either it would work, then we would be all the good friends and it would work and it would never be a problem because it just fits our personality. Or it would be just the opposite, but then you would leave immediately. Now we have a 100,000 people company with a lot of nice other stuff, which you talked about, the global one, the possibility to have 10 different jobs without even leaving the company under one roof. And then the question is, do I then accept a lousy culture because we know left and right, there are better cultures in the same company. So how can we form a corporate culture that is really universal and where people get incentivized, you know, to have to motivate people and not to frustrate people? to create uh, a work atmosphere where I come every morning to the office and say, hey, glad that I can come. And that ho hopefully the weekend comes and I can get away from that thing. As long as the pay comes, I will stay. But if I have a better opportunity, I will leave. But I think that really depends also on the people that are at work. So are these people that I love to interact with? Do I enjoy working with them? And that makes a big difference mm. in coming to work with a sense of, yes, I want to be there. Or is it more like, oh, no, I have to work with them again? I mean, one of the opportunities of our company is, uh, or, or let's say that of our company, it's like with any large company, is that you can have so many different jobs without ever leaving the company. And I had it in my career. I, I think I worked in sales. I worked in controlling. I, I had engineering projects. I uh, did production I run different business units. I worked 15 years of my life in the United States or 14. And that is really exciting. It never changed the company. What are your plans for your life? What could you picture? Any two, three jobs you would like to do during the course of the next 30 years? Oh, I think there are so many opportunities. And in the end, it always depends yeah. on what makes sense as a next step. For me, I just changed jobs and into the team leader position end of last year. So so look 10 years ahead. Be specific. What would you like to do 10 years ahead? And 10 years, it's enough because whoever has a job today in 10 years won't have the job. So you're not going after something. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I think what would be interesting is looking at the strategic part of our company mm -hmm. in the sense that where do we want to go from where we are in 10 years, but where do we want to be in 20 years, so mm -hmm. to say? So that would be definitely a part that I could imagine going for at some so point. So I take that now as an application for my job? or <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe that as well. <laughs> Who knows what comes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, clear. There is a lot of opportunities, certainly. I don't want to be rude here. There are a lot of opportunities to think this uh, strategically ahead, you know, and, and really try to plan out what comes. And on the other side, execution is similarly important. I think the good mix will make it. Philip, now you had the time to, to think about <laughs> yes. what job you are going for. <laughs> uh, in the first place, I, I want to gain expertise in, in, in the expert track. Uh, the testing area, so the, this, this optimization process at the end of the development, especially in vehicle testing, is at the moment for me the best job I can imagine. But of course, at the same time, if I'm looking... In two, 10 years, I want to develop myself and maybe take also lead responsibility. Martin, now I have a question for you. You told us all the different steps that you did in your career. Was that more planned steps or did it just happen to you automatically? I would always say, and I think it's really true, I never, ever applied for a job inside Daimler. I applied for my first job at Daimler and I got it. And then up from that day on, I never applied for a job. And I was always asked to do another job That's interesting. before I was bored of the old one. It was always, oh, is it now really time to move on to another job? It's an advice I give always, there is no good and bad job. It's only you who are doing a job well or badly. If it's a boring job, take it as an opportunity 
come up with your own ideas. Because you will need anyhow later if you want to really change something, have your own ideas. And a boring job gives you the time to have own ideas. And if it's a job where you are completely overwhelmed because it burns you out, then you have to figure out how to do the job more efficient. What is necessary that you don't come to a burnout? Don't get burnout, but change the environment, the processes to make things more efficient, cut out the waste. So regardless of what the job is, it's always what you are doing with the job. It's never the job's fault. And I think that was always something, and I'll come back to your question, I always did the job like this is the only job, this is the job I love, and then I could do something. And the moment you come with this attitude, you change stuff. And then you become emotionally attached to that job. And then, yeah, and in a good company, you are seen then suddenly. And then the next job is coming. And the next job normally will be bigger than the first one. And then you can grow over time. So, no, I didn't plan my career. And I tell you, I could see a lot of endings without Vorstand. And I'm still being very happy. I would say that was a great conversation. Thanks for being here. Thanks to all the listeners. And I'm looking forward that you join us again for the next episode of Transportation Matters because transportation truly matters for all of us. Until then, take care. That was Transportation Matters, the CEO podcast of Daimler Trucks and Buses. If you enjoyed what you've heard, Share this episode and subscribe to Transportation Matters on your preferred podcast platform. You can do this by tapping the follow or subscribe button right next to the podcast title. 